Hello everyone, Miles Ezilo here, back with another episode of The Monumental Project. Last month we kicked off the season with a very special discussion with Take Em Down Jacksonville founder Wells Todd. Check that out if you haven't already. Today we'll be jumping right into the heart of the matter when it comes to monuments of oppression, making your voice heard. Although there are many methods that one can use to make a change against painful pieces of history, one of the most direct ways to do this is by showing up and doing something about it. This is the subject of today's episode, Boots on the Ground. We've all seen videos of citizens around the country taking matters into their own hands when it comes to monuments of oppression. However, rarely do we hear from these individuals in the communities and organizations they represent. Today, the Monumental Project sits down with community activist Mike Forsha and Commissioner Tammy Sawyer, two individuals who are agents of change in their own ways. We'll hear about how they came into this field of work and what they want to change for the future. We'll also be speaking to author and American art historian Aaron Thompson on the history of public demonstrations against public monuments. Let's get started. Iconoclasm, the social belief in the importance of the destruction of icons and other images or monuments, most frequently for religious or political reasons. Monuments seen as symbols of European colonialism have been torn down in several countries. These actions span across nations taking place in Ethiopia, Venezuela, Egypt, and many other countries after a shift in power has taken place, often from the hands of tyrannical and oppressive regimes. The United States is no different. Since its founding, the U.S. has also been deconstructing statues. One of the earliest documented incidents occurred in 1776, just five days after the ratification of the Declaration of Independence. Soldiers and citizens tore down a golden statue of Britain's King George III in Manhattan. So what changed? Well, the debate around protesting against monuments has created a strong divide between those wanting to honor the past and those who see the past as a painful reminder. To some, the statues represent the country's history, no matter how complicated. Taking them down is to censor, whitewash, and potentially forget that history. On the other hand, the growing majority believe that the statues misrepresent history. More specifically, they glorify people who perpetuated slavery, upheld outdated values, and lost the Civil War. To get a professional opinion on the matter, I spoke with Aaron L. Thompson. Thompson is an American art historian, lawyer, and professor in the Department of Art and Music at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. She's also the author of the great book, Smashing Statues, The Rise and Fall of American Monuments. So the audience already has a pretty decent idea of what you do, um, but just as like a warm-up question, well, what is a professor of art crime? Um, I've seen that in uh, emails, and I've seen that on the back of your book, Smashing Statues, The Rise and Fall of American Monuments, and I was just so interested by that title. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, not that many people study the subject because not that many people are uh, as, as dorky to go to as much school as I have. So I have a PhD in ancient Greek and Roman art history and a JD. And I worked for lawyers a little bit before coming back into uh, the academy to study all sorts of intersections between art and crime. So I have long been interested in the looting and smuggling of antiquities, museum security, forgeries, things like that. Uh, and also the deliberate destruction or the uh, sometimes equally problematic deliberate preservation of works of art. Interesting. And was this a path that you were always planning on going down or was this something that you almost stumbled upon? It all makes sense looking backwards, but going forwards, it didn't make any sense at all. <laughs> I just <laughs> followed what I was interested in. Uh, and I actually thought that there would never really be any impact in, in the contemporary world. I thought, oh, destroying art on purpose, that's something that happened in the past and I didn't really understand. Uh, when I started out, that that's something that a lot of societies do pretty much any time there's a big transition in, in power. Right, right, right. Yes, definitely. And that brings me to uh, the first question. So yeah, can you briefly speak on iconoclasm and its role in defining social movements throughout history? Uh, you had an a interesting section in the book where you said, you know, as soon as humans, like you said, started making monuments to glorify rulers, others began tearing them down to show they didn't want to be governed by them. Um, yeah, how important is iconoclasm in social movements? Well, I think that anybody who's ever 
deleted a photo of their ex or taken <laughs> a photo down from their fridge or something, you should know, you know, you don't always want to have reminders of the people you once thought were, were the best uh, right. in your life. And it can be really painful to be confronted with those reminders are really frustrating. So if this happens all the time in our own lives, imagine how much it also happens in, in communities or societies when you change from say a monarchy to a democracy or in America as we're seeing these days when you start to think, wait, who is it that should hold power and wealth? Uh, mm -hmm. Should it be the same people who are overwhelmingly represented in public monuments, or is it a different set of folks? And if so, do we need a different set of, of folks represented on monuments? Hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, an art is such a a big point of history. It's markers of, you know, how we were thinking, how we were feeling during a certain moment. So it's almost healthy to, in my opinion, to take things and bring things up pull things down as the the times and opinions of the people change so such an yeah, interesting and topic. sometimes yeah it can be really interesting to see how people not just pull things down and, and make them disappear you know not just want to forget that a history ever existed but can change things you can use a monument that was praising one thing to praise another or to call that former ideology into question uh, and what's really interesting to me about these last couple of years is that we've seen a lot of monuments disappear, a lot more than have changed. Um, and that's because the laws that are set in place to protect monuments protect them from change so much that it's, it's easier just to disappear a monument, more or less, um, than to have it change to make a commentary on the, the history that it used to praise. Right, right. Um, you know, you dived into this a bit in your book, but are there real world effects to protesting and attempts to take monuments down? Statistically, you know, the numbers go, they change and they're a little bit different depending on where you look. But as a whole, um, when you're out in the streets and making, you know, a, a name for what you stand out against, um, has there really been change against actually taking these monuments down? That's a real complicated answer question to answer because the answer depends on where you look mm. and what you consider change. So since the murder of George Floyd, over 200 public monuments have been taken from their pedestals in uh, the United States. Right. But what does that mean? One of the things that I started to ask myself when reading these news stories that I tried to answer in my book was, well, where do these monuments go once they go off their, their pedestals? So it turns out that I could not locate a single uh, Confederate monument that has been irrevocably destroyed, irrevocably removed from view. Mm -hmm. uh, and I could only find one other statue, uh, just a, a, a small carving of Columbus that had been chipped off a bigger monument right. uh, and thus can't be restored. Everything else has been relocated to some maybe slightly less prominent site, a historic cemetery or a battlefield instead of, you know, the, the town square, mm -hmm. uh, or is in storage uh, with the possibility of redisplay with its fate still up for debate. What were the pieces that you found that you kind of surprised you about the protests that, you know, have been going on around statues? Um, what instance of, you know, protest and activism surprised you the most for good and bad reasons? Well, I started to see, I was reading a lot of media reports about uh, the removal of statues, and mm -hmm. I started to get frustrated that wait, there are these questions that I want to know the answers to, or there are these assumptions that I know are just not right. Right. So I already talked about asking, you know, well, where are those trucks going once the statue is taken down and put into the truck and it drives away and everybody cheers? I want to know where is it headed? Um, but there's a, also, I saw a lot of people saying, oh, um, this is terrible. It is just sort of uncivilized or un-American to tear down a statue. And I thought, whoa, hold on. You know, this is uh, something that's very human that we do all the time. And also the very first public monument in metal uh, that was ever put up in America lasted only seven years. 
there was a statue of King George III. Right. And then New Yorkers heard the Declaration of Independence read. They tore that sucker down, melted it. Uh, it was made out of uh, lead covered in gold leaf. Uh, and they cast that lead into bullets to use to fight King George's army. <laughs> so wow. it's actually pretty darn American to um, regard a statue not as something that is art and untouchable of and needs to last forever, but no, it's something that can help you get to your future, so to speak. Um, and I also uh, was noticing how many people's voices were left out of these. Uh, news reports, especially the voices of activists. Unfortunately, this is often the case. Many activists in this space are silenced in the name of cultural and historical accuracy. However, every so often, a catalyst moment occurs that creates a wave of change. One example of this took place in Minneapolis in 2020. After speaking out against the Christopher Columbus statue downtown for years, Native American activist Mike Forsha decided to take matters into his own hands. In the uh, in the activism and you know cultural heritage space, you're pretty well known. But to our newer listeners, if you could provide a description of who you are and the work you do, that would be great. Uh, my name is Mike Forsha. I am chairman of the American Indian Movement on the Twin Cities. Uh, I've been chairman since September. 10th of 2011. Uh, I've been very involved in the Minneapolis Indian community. I've sat on uh, maybe almost a dozen nonprofit boards. Mm -hmm. And um, we at one time uh, worked with the school district and we shut down one of our own schools. Um, and it was unprecedented. And we got a new building, we got to name the school. We got to hire the teachers and yeah, we've been doing a lot of work here in the Twin Cities. Wow. Wow. Thank you for that. And I'm sure the Twin Cities uh, appreciates all the work that you've done. Um, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. If you don't mind, can you take me back to that day in 2020? Uh, what were some of the emotions that you were feeling as you were, of course, taking down the Columbus statue? Okay. Um, well, it started on the 9th. Of course, you know about what happened in Richmond, Virginia and the decapitation in Boston Harbor. Um, so I was just laying in my bed, paging through Facebook, and I seen that there was a, a post that someone had mentioned that the statue in St. Paul was a target mm. and they were gonna do it in the middle of the night. And that's what started it. I knew I had two choices. I could either do it and face the consequences that way, or I could not do it and let someone else do it and you know let the chips fall where they may. Right. But I had plans for that guy. I had big plans for him. And and I knew in my mind that if he if he went down in the middle of the night, that the headlines would say exactly that. Columbus was vandalized under the cover of darkness. We have no suspects. We're going to clean them off and we'll put them back up, case closed. Right. And I did not want that to be the headlines because, because I knew, um, and see, so many people in Minnesota don't even know or didn't know there was even a statue there, mm. for one thing. But we knew. We knew he was there and we knew what the legacy he brought meant. And so... And so I knew that there was like 25, 30,000 people that went there and celebrated him in broad daylight, mm. putting him up and uncovering him. And there was no way I was going to allow someone to come in and just do that. And I understand why they do it. They don't want to charge. They don't want the, the penalty. They don't want the fine. They don't want any of that. Of course. And I sat up all night working on Facebook posts because the decision was already made. Right. Because I wasn't about to, to face the consequences of not doing it. Hmm. And um, and so I put out a Facebook post and there was no way I could call anybody because we have been going down there so long and there's certain people who always show up. Right. And I wanted to call them and say, today's the day he's coming down. But there was no way I could because I knew what they were, the investigation, you know, I just didn't want to put anybody in that. Of course. 
And so um, I, at about 11 o'clock, I posted it, I believe it was. And I called the Lieutenant Governor's office and I called the mayor's office and the governor's office. And I invited them to the ceremony. I said that I knew that they were so busy with the, the city's burning mm. and George Floyd and uh, the curfews and the virus. And I knew all that was happening. But please, if you could give me five minutes of your time and show the world that we are united in this. And of course, I knew that there was no way that they could accept, but it was a way to get it out there. It was a way to be polite about it. But today was the day. And so there were two friends of mine, two allies, accomplices, whatever you want to call them who are always there for me. And so those are the two who I picked up. I went to the store, we bought the rope, we headed down there. And so I get there and um, because of my reputation and because of the, you know, the American Indian movement, because if, if it was just me, I'd probably still be down there pulling. Wow. But, pe but people knew um, my persuasion and my reputation. And so they started showing up. And then another one showed up and there was a reporter there. And then all of a sudden here comes Captain Eric Roski. And um, he's got some papers in his hand. And he was pleading with me to take the paperwork, take the application, please take the application. And of course, at that point, I'm just a visitor. I'm just a tourist. I'm mm -hmm. not causing, you know. Um, and so I explained to him and I said, if you weren't wearing that, I said, some people would consider you a brown shirt. I said, but you take the uniform off and give us a hand, help us. But of course, he swore an oath to the Constitution that he couldn't do that. I said, the whole world is watching. I said, do you want to hurt us? Do you want to beat us? Do you want to shoot us? Do you, is that what's going to happen here? I said, right. because he is coming down. And I told him to call. I said, you have to make the call. And I knew Peggy was watching and the governor was watching live. You know, they were all watching. And um, so he went to make his phone call. And at five o'clock, that rope landed at my feet like it was supposed to. Mm -hmm. And I made a couple of nooses, tried to get around his neck. Um, the skinny little white kid showed up and he bounced up there, <laughs> grabbed the rope, put, put him around his neck, slapped him in the face a little bit. The crowd cheered him on. And then I asked the women to come forward. Right. I said, the women, I need you on the front of the rope because the women are really true leaders in our communities mm -hmm. and they have to retake that role again. And because of his legacy of our missing and murdered Indian women and the rapes and just all the horrific things that he, he's, uh, uh, his legacy has caused. And I asked the men to get behind the women and to give them their strength and to always stand behind the women from that point on. And we had our two spirit relatives there. It was amazing. Mm, I can imagine. And they just tugged it once. And I seen that rope squeeze into just this little bitty string, it seemed like. And I thought, oh, no. Oh, no, it's not going to happen. And it seemed like forever, of course. But they pulled it again. And within a minute and a half, maybe two minutes, I would say, boom. And I knew it was going to be big here. I honestly did. Mm. But I had no idea that the repercussions it would have, you know, in this country and around the world. So many Christopher Columbus statues came down and even, you know, Columbus, Ohio purposely took theirs down. Right. And then, of course, the right started passing laws everywhere, making it so much harder to get statues down. For him to come down in broad daylight, no matter what happened to me, 
meant that those conversations could start happening. Man, that's a crazy story. And it's actually leading up into my uh, next question. Uh, when it comes to the process, you said, right? Um, I read that, you know, you were often told to follow the process in the correct, the correct way to address these symbols of oppression. Um, and now you're, you know, saying that there really never was a process. Um, you know, it was just kind of a thing that, you know, people say in charge to, you know, kind of shoo people away from the actual work that needs to be done. So in your opinion, do you feel like the correct process ever has the ability to bring about necessary change? I believe that it does. I believe there's a place for it, but I also believe that that process takes way too long. We mm. are in a paradigm shift and we have to get rid of the old ways of doing stuff with this committees and hearings. And they should make in Minnesota here, they should make a blanket law, if that's what you want to call it, that there's no Christopher Columbus statues can be in the public square, mm. period. That should be nationwide. You want to have one in your front yard, go for it. You want to have one in your place of business, go for it. But you take them out of the public square. That should be automatic all across the country. Those, those things should be put away. Those things should be um, used as a, as a tool for education. That's what they should be used for. But it shouldn't be left where it is and just put another statue kind of like to balance it out. No, those have to be gone. They okay. should not be in a place of honor, and he should never be on a pedestal ever again. He should be right on the floor. It goes without saying that activists and organizers are skeptical about the role the government plays in the monument conversation. As much as we want to believe in the process of politics making the right decisions for us, many citizens aren't buying it anymore. To hear a perspective from both sides of the ballot box, we spoke to Commissioner Tammy Sawyer. Commissioner Sawyer is a Shelby County Commissioner in Memphis, Tennessee, and the creator of the Take Him Down 901 movement. So for our listeners, can you please provide a description of who you are and the work you do? Hey everybody, my name is Tammy Sawyer. I am a county commissioner in Shelby County, uh, which is the southernmost, south, southwestern part of Tennessee. I mm -hmm. represent Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I am an activist, I am an academic, I write, I uh, protest, I struggle like most mm -hmm. people for change. Um, led a movement called Take Them Down 901, which was responsible for removing Confederate statues in Tennessee um, and continue to try to do work that will leave the world a better place than I found it. Wow, that's a great bio. <laughs> I really <appreciate> <laughs> um, You made the transition I wouldn't say transition, but you, yeah, you run that balance between activism uh, and politics. Was this always mm -hmm. the plan to make that shift? So, yes. Um, actually, my activist friends and I had a conversation about it. Like, um, you know, I said I want to run. Mm -hmm. And they were like, why? And I talked, I'll never forget talking to my friend, Reverend Earl Fisher, about it. And he was like, all right. But you know, as soon as you get elected, I'm gonna hold you accountable every day. And I used to get so mad at him, like, you don't have to hold me accountable. I'm one up. Right. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I haven't changed. He, I haven't changed. <laughs> Go hold somebody else accountable. And right. so he used to say that all the time. But I realized he's right. I mean, you get, you, I wanted to come in, kicking in the door, like radicalizing and not even radicalizing, but like changing so much. And government is so slow and so backlogged um, that, like, being an activist, an, a, a person who was elected, like, on a change platform, after four years, I looked back and I was like, I would be disappointed in you. Mm. Now, a lot of people don't agree with that. They're like, you, you did more change making than most, but is that enough? You know, and of course, it's not that I didn't do anything, but, you know, I, I tweeted about it today. I saw a uh, person, a uh, progressive candidate, um, put out a platform talking about increasing uh, pay raises for police, but wow. it didn't include pay raises for fire. It didn't include pay raises for um, EMTs. It was just 
just very like that what I call not just I but what many call like propaganda like continuing to mm. treat police as a protected class like let's talk about pay raises for government officials let's talk about I mean government workers you know and include right. police in that but like if we continue to have this protected class then we continue to like fail to make change with like their relation with the community right, right. or to be able to hold them accountable and I was just really disappointed in seeing this person who I know knows better uh, put this platform out. And then I said, you know, you can say I'm going to make change once I get inside. But once you get inside, it's almost like when you make a cake, you know, you put the egg in there. But where's the egg once you stir the batter? Mm, I never wanted to become the batter. So right, I'm no right. longer I'm not running anymore. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pulling my eggshells out the mix wow. so I could keep keep kicking indoors wow love that interesting um i'm gonna i'm gonna jot that down because i never said that one before <laughs> that was, i like that that was nice <laughs> wow. oh man no. right 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 <laughs> how important is community involvement when it comes to fixing public spaces uh you know some people think that there isn't much that can be done but as a public official now what can you say to people who want to do something about their neighborhood but don't really know how start number one i mean you know people thought i was crazy miles like one of my very good friends will tell this story about her involvement with take him down and she will say i thought Kaylee was out of her mind mm -hmm. but that's my girl <laughs> so i was like we riding on these statues okay right. <laughs> she's like and then they came down and i was like oh <laughs> you know <laughs> um so I will say number one is start. We could talk till we're blue in the face about changing the physical landscape or removing these monuments or they don't belong there. Um, and waiting, you know, hoping that the elected officials will respond to that and, you know, things like that. Or we can just do something. I mean, I was, I was an elected official, you know, I take them down happened before I was elected, but also as an elected official and after George Floyd was killed, you know, I joined other people and we changed the entire street, Jackson Avenue. Uh, at four in the morning, we got up, we ordered signs, like new uh, street signs. Mm -hmm. And it's named for Andrew Jackson, a uh, right. terrorist, murderer of thousands of indigenous and black people, slave owner, racist, I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. um, Throw me a president name, I'll tell you the sort of history. Hey, you know them uh, by <laughs> I know them by them. Because you gotta know the facts. You have yeah, of course. to because the people who want to shut this type of work down think we are just emotional. Mm. They don't know the history. Right. right. And because they realize we do know the history, that's why you've got this like quote unquote anti CRT movement. But I'm off base for your question. So what we did, we we got up at like four in the morning and we covered Jackson Avenue, every intersection sign with Black Lives Matter Boulevard. Wow. And uh, so I did this, I do this like space reclaiming work as an elected mm -hmm. because I couldn't get that street name changed as an elected, you know, but I, so I did it with the activists. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so don't just wait for your elected officials because oftentimes there is going to be a barrier you know like i signed a agreement to uphold the constitution of the state of tennessee as trash as it is you know mm. it still recognizes slavery like mm. <laughs> so uh you know and so and i sit with 12 other people who are always going very often do not agree with my ideas and so right. you know so i say start the people have to clamor. We got Forest Avenue after the statues came down. Forest Avenue was changed from forest with two R's to forest like a set of trees, mm -hmm. one R, because the people went out and got petitions, raised the money, and, and demanded that the city make that change. So mm -hmm. like if you are frustrated by the presence of white supremacy in your city, whether it's the name of a school or a park, or it's a statue, you have the power to make the change. You just gotta make the noise. 
All in all, one can see how the role of public demonstration against historical fixtures is a practice that is deeper than most people think. The history, the personal experiences, and the protocols moving forward paint a much bigger picture. Activism and protests look differently to everybody, and success varies, but when it comes to addressing monuments of oppression, speaking out and making your voice heard has been one of the most useful tools to make a change. How do you feel about the protesting against controversial monuments? Please reach out with your opinions to our submission email, monumental at usicthemost.org. We would love to hear from you. Join us next month as we speak to yet another incredible leader in the historic preservation movement. You won't want to miss it. As always, I'm Miles Zessilo. We'll talk soon.